Hi folks, hope you're okay today, it's good to be with you. I just want to give some thoughts, critical reflection on the science of Hadith. And uh, my, my name is Jason and my website is jasonburnspreacher.com and you can look at me up on Twitter and Facebook. And we're just going to look at this article um, from Islamic Awareness and it's on the science of Hadith. And I want to make some scholarly reflection on the, the piece of work here uh, and, and give you my uh, scholarly reply to some of the comments on this paper on the science of Hadith. So let's read it. Uh, Quran uh, Surah 15.9 We have without doubt set down the message and we will surely guard it from corruption. So, here is a doctrine of preservation. Here's the question. If the Quran teaches a doctrine of preservation for the Quran, why on earth didn't God, if he brought the Injil and Torah, have a doctrine of preservation for, for them? It seems a contradiction to believe that the Quran can be preserved, but know the writing that God gave. And the, Christ, uh, the Muslims believe that the Torah, the Injil, and the Tabor were given the Psalms were given by God. So if God has a doctrine of preservation here that he will protect the Quran, why will, would he not protect his other revelations that he's given before? So the Muslims have a big problem here and contradict themselves when they say the Bible has been corrupted. We, we go on. The, the writer says, and you can get the article, uh, Islamic Awareness is the website, and uh, the science of Hadith uh, from a USC Muslim Students Association Islamic server. All right. And, um, okay. So we read. The promise made by Allah in Quran 15.9 is obviously fulfilled in the undisputed purity of the Quranic text throughout the 14 centuries since its revelation. So, it says undisputed purity of the Quranic text throughout the 14 centuries since its revelation. Undisputed. That is not true. To say it is undisputed means that it's been thoroughly documented and stated without reservation that it's been that it's been kept pure that the Quran has been kept pure. But we have not got the cons scholarly scholarly consensus to say without reservation that the Quranic text has been preserved. The Cambridge Can Companion to Quran as clearly states that there has never been a critical edition of, of the Quran concerning its textual veracity, concerning textual criticism. So that statement is, is blatantly false and incorrect. <clears throat> he goes on, what, however, what is often forgotten by many Muslims is that the divine promise also includes by necessity the Sunnah of the Prophet. Now that's interesting. He goes on because the Sunnah is the practical example of the implementation of the Quranic guidance, the wisdom taught by the Prophet along with the Scripture. That neither the Quran nor the Sunnah can be understood correctly without the other. If that is the case, if you cannot understand the Quran without the Sunnah, then it means that the Quran isn't the Word of God, that it is, it is limited and that it needs other revelations or other scripture to supplement it. So there is a theological problem about the sufficiency of the Quranic text. He goes on, Allah has preserved the Sunnah by enabling the companions and those after them to memorize write down and pass on the statements of the Prophet and the descriptions of his 
way as well as to continue the blessings of practicing a sonnet. Later, as the purity of the knowledge of the sunnah became threatened, Allah caused the Muslim Ummah to produce individuals with exceptional memory, skills and analytic expertise who travelled tirelessly to collect thousands of narrations and distinguish the true words of, of prophetic wisdom from those corrupted by weak memories, from forgeries by unscrupulous liars and from the statements of a large number of Ummah scholars the companions and those who followed their way, all of this was achieved through the precise attention to the words narrated and detailed familiarity with the biography of thousands of reporters of Hadith. So this is a very, very interesting. It's very, very interesting from a historical analysis and an historical from a historian's point of view and, 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 and investigating history. And also from a textual, uh, textual critic point of view, it, this is a very, very interesting statement. Notice here the emphasis on accuracy. Later, as the purity of the knowledge of the Sunnah became threatened, Allah caused the Muslim Ummah to produce individuals with notice with exceptional memory skills, analytical expertise, who travelled tirelessly to collect thousands of narrations and distinguish the true words of prophetic wisdom from those corrupted by weak memories. Do you understand what's being done here? What's being done here is there is a sense, there is an unwitting giving away the evidence of corruption within Islamic history and textual uh, 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 and textual compilation of the Quran. This statement unwittingly proves the lack of textual veracity of the Quran and also the unreliability of the history of that textual history and the life of. Uh, the false prophet Muhammad. I have to sell false prophets, so forgive me. I don't believe he's a true prophet. So why is that the case? Well, imagine um, I'm a liar, okay? And as a liar, someone has been able to detect that one of my sources is a, is a lie. So, for example, uh, maybe I'm being taken to court for fraud for um, embezzling money from an insurance company. And somebody's got two or three letters which show my signature showing that I've actually signed for money to be transferred into my account. Right? In order for me to bury, absolutely bury, the people who were trying to criticise me and bring these letters, I need to now ratchet it up and bring in authorities that will buttress my position. So my position is I'm guilty. The three letters that they've got prove that I am guilty. So what I do now is when I come before the court, I say I have absolute pristine documents, hundreds of them, signed by the most brilliant, honest, circumspect people that have ever worked for the insurance company ever. And if only you would look at their signatures and their documents, it will show you that these three signatures that you purport that I have done is incorrect. Because my sources are so pristine and so amazingly good that you... Uh, you just don't stand a chance. 
And then you see what I've done. I've been caught red-handed. I am guilty by these three letters, but I have now created an authority, this myth of these amazing documents with amazing authority that trump these three documents. And that's what this has done here. This is like saying, look, we've got all this amazing expertise in collecting these stories that you can be sure that what we're saying is correct. But it's proven, because they're emphasizing so much the brilliance of their sources, it gives it away that there was actually sources that weren't so brilliant in the first place. So they're actually unwittingly giving away the truth without realizing it. And all we have to do is someone uh, has got three letters to prove that I am guilty. All we've got to do is look at the letters. And once we look at the three letters and we have the evidence, then we can also look at these false sources that I brought up for about clearing my name, say, about all these hundreds of documents that are with great authority. All we have to look at is to see that these documents have a false authority, that they're not as clear cut as I'm making out to be. And it's the same here. So, for example, when you look at the early sources of the Quran, for example, I think, uh, I think I might have it here, but just check in here. Yeah, so we, so, so, um, So the early sources about the Quran and the history of Islam, like if you go to Sayyid Bukhari, volume 6, 61, 656, Sari al-Bukhari, volume 6, 61, 513, Sunni Abdu Dawood, uh, BK3, number 1015, Sari al-Bukhari, volume 6, BK61, 514, Sari al-Bukhari, volume 6, 61, Sunni al Tamari 3103. You look at all these sources, um, shows you that the early companions forgot the Quran. So, here, this grandiose statement the Quran has been preserved, the sun has been preserved. We've got all these great collectors that have great memories and were able to sort out the right truth. Here, even in their own sources, shows you that they were forgetting things that they weren't as pristine as this statement is making out to be. Then if you look at uh, Al-Bakari volume 660, 468, Sari ba Al-Bakari volume 660, 467, Sari Muslim uh, 799802, Sari Al-Bakari volume 6, BK61, 527, shows you that the Companions actually, when they collected it and memorized it, memorized it differently from each other. And then, if you look at um, the famous librarian Al Nidham in the year 375 HE to 987 AD, listed a whole series of books dealing with these different collections and the differences between them. He recalls that Abdullah ibn Masood version of the Quran had 110, 12. Surahs, while Abai and Ibn Kabir's collection had 116. So, again, early in their history and sources, shows you that the accuracy of their sources was not as accurate as they make out to be. The Quran, for example, was not preserved as they're saying. Okay. So, so the person comes and brings three letters showing that I've embezzled. I haven't embezzled anything, by the way, but this is just for the sake of argument. Someone brings three letters showing that I've embezzled. What we've done here, we've showed you, and so that would attack my integrity and show me that I'm guilty. What we've seen here is the early sources of Islam show that 
the accuracy of their historical recording and textual criticism is not as accurate as they make out to be, so they're guilty, right? So, it undermines the fact of this so-called amazing preservation. Later, as the purity of the knowledge of the Sunni became threatened, Allah caused Muslim Ummah to produce individuals with exceptional memory. We proved the case that that's not the case, that they had bad memories. Skills and analytical expertise, we've shown that even in those sources, which I quoted to you, they were different in the memorization. Who travelled tires listened to thousands of narrations and distinguished the true words of prophetic. Well, if they did, they didn't get rid of these sources, which actually prove that a case against them. Distinguish the true words of prophetic wisdom from those corrupted by weak memories. Now, there are stories within the hadiths. For example, there is a story of uh, Aisha complaining in Bukhari to Muhammad that the revelations that he was having seemed to be suiting him. So there are these uncomfortable narrations in the hadiths and in the strongest hadiths that undermine uh, Muhammad, undermine the Islamic view. Yet these are the people that are supposed to be masters of preserving the truth, the information about um, the Quran and Muhammad. Now, the problem here is that a lot of times the Muslims will then often say, well, you can't trust all the hadiths, even the best hadiths uh, can be imperfect. But that's always the case when information in the hadiths do not suit you. It goes on. The methodology of the expert scholars of hadith in assessing the narrations and sorting out the genuine from the mistaken and fabricated for M's, the subject matter of science of Hadith. In this article, a brief discussion. Right. The methodology of the expert scholars of Hadith. Number one. Where in the Quran do we get the methodology for the Hadiths? If there is no methodology for understanding the Hadiths from the Quran, a historical methodology then what authority do these, do these methodologies have in Quran in, in uh, Hadith scholarship who gave authority who gave authority to Hadith scholars whether in the early days of Islam or right up until the golden age of Islam. But where did the authority come from for them to collect hadiths? Are they inspired prophets? The answer is no. Are they authority people from God? The answer is no. So these collections of hadiths are by imperfect people and because they're by imperfect people they will have mistakes in them so they cannot be a hundred percent preserved and that preservation needs to be clarified more intricately as what they mean by preserved a hadith is composed of three parts the three parts are chain of report me. a chain of reporters Matin, uh, Mayan, I think Matin text and Taraf. Matin text inside chain of reporters and Taraf the part of the beginning of sentence of the text. 
which refers to the sayings, actions or characteristics of the Prophet or his occurrence with other action. The authenticity of hadith depends on the reliability of its reporters and the linkage among them. So let's just meditate on that just for a second. The, authentic, the authenticity of the hadith depends on the reliability of its reporters and the linkage among them. Excuse me. How is it possible to assess somebody's memory? How is it possible to assess the human ability to pass information on in antiquity? If from the Quran, uh, the so-called revelation of the Quran, to the production of it, the had uh, the Quran by Uthman, in the space in between, who gave who gave who authority to collect the Quran? Who gave who authority to produce the the hadiths? And what I'm saying is this: is that what we're seeing here is human ingenuity, human ability. When the, when the New Testament was written, it was written by apostles, and it was God who guided and superintended them. But this is not by any spiritual authoritative person. The Hadith, and not by any spiritual person who was given the authority to collect these hadiths and to develop this methodology. So it's really human ingenuity. And all I'm saying is we assess the human ingenuity of individuals. No matter how brilliant we are, they are, they are fallible. So you can never have a fully accurate source of information because there will always be fallibility within the system. Because the foundation of the system was just human ingenuity. Classification of hadiths. Number one, reference to a particular authority. Number two, so uh, you have sacred, elevated, stopped and served. Number three, number of reporters involved in each stage of inset. Number five, reliability and memory of the reporters. Uh, Sai, sound, good, weak, fabricated, forged. This is criteria. You have a uh, number of reporters, consecutive, isolated, famous, rare, scarce. Number of reporters, you have links of the inside inter in interrupted or uninterrupted, supported, hurried, continuous, broken, perplexing, hanging. Nature of the text, saic, thick, additions by a reliable reporter, Munker, denounced, etc. A couple of things that come to point uh, with with this system. Um, I'll just show you the system. Is that there's a system there, and they've got a list of the science of how they do hadiths and some observations that come come to mind here. Um, I think the first thing to, to come to mind is when you read the Hadith like Bukhari 
very often the the very short snippets of so-called uh, Muhammad sayings. So what 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 you find is the material that has been collected has been shaped. That's the first thing. So it doesn't matter how many of these people here are um, according to their criteria uh, can have a good pedigree where they're connected to the right people or whatever. They might have the right memory or whatever. Or The fact of the matter is the nature of the hadiths have been doctored, have, have been changed. Because the material that is given is very often in a particular shape, in a particular form. In order for the material to be collected and collated. So for example, I might have um, 80 stories from the Bible, say. A very length, a book, a story from um, the story from the Gospels and stories from Paul's epistles and stories from the Old Testament, Daniel. And I, I might have all these collection of stories, but what I do is I reduce every one of the stories, big chapters, long chapters, I reduce them all to a, just a few words and to a particular style and a particular way of reading so that when I get all the chain of these statements, they're all generally very similar and so then I can collect them and put them in one category. And that's what uh, all this chain of narration um, undermines its historical integrity because a lot of these hadiths, have been, the material has been shaped, changed and, and reduced to a formula for collection. So it undermines all these so-called criteria. Secondly, uh, when you read the hadiths uh, in Bukhari, for example, you get very, very little historical detail concerning the, the actual historical background of, of the times. So, for example, um, if you read, say, the Gospel of Luke, you get detailed information uh, about the times. You'll, you'll know a lot about the Sadducees and the, Sad, the Pharisees, and you'll know a lot about Pontius Pilate and, and how the Romans conducted themselves and all the political shenanigans of, of the time of first century Judaism, you get a flavour of the history and the times by reading the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. You get historical detail. But what you get with the Hadiths is very little historical detail. And what that shows you is these stories, actually, many of them are not at the time of Muhammad, but come later. Because they're not rooted in any real historical time frame or culture. So it, all this criteria does not get rid of the fact that a lot of this historical material is not historical. It's not rooted in any real history but is really rooted in a political oral tradition, political oral traditions. So we'll get onto that now. So the next point I want to say is political oral tradition. That a lot of these hadiths were circulated and this is PhD work that I've been reading, uh, which I'll, I'll link to some other time. I'll put under the video so that you can go and read the PhD, particular PhD that I'm thinking about. So this is a PhD that I've, I've read some of the work, and I'm just bringing this in. Um, but recent PhD research um, has shown that a lot of these hadiths 
um, were done, were, were, were used to and circulated to buttress certain political and um, economic and ideological uh, challenges that various um, Islamic uh, groups were facing. So, for example, um, a caliph might give give uh, some land to uh, a nobleman, and then the caliph, the caliph, that caliphate would die, and a new caliphate would come into power. But that would challenge the nobleman's right to the land. But if the nobleman can use uh, documents or uh, hadiths that stories that actually back up the nobleman's right to the land then you know all the better for the nobleman and if that hadith is continually circulated throughout the family it will continue to justify the family's right to that land and there were many many issues like that in, in the history of early Islam rights to land and property, right to economic, uh, econ uh, right to uh, various economic enterprises, uh, trade routes, etc. Uh, also you have uh, quite clearly, uh, you have uh, in the early time of Islam you had Uthman, you had Ali and other caliphates and these are political uh, infighting and rebellion going on and so hadiths that are preserved or, or that are produced will um, buttress certain political sides so all this uh, science of hadith a lot of it's vacuous because it doesn't take into consideration the political the cultural and the economic and the social uh, reproduction of these hadiths and why these hadiths were being produced and why they were being passed on okay so I want to bring that down to three three areas really number one there's no divine authority for the hadiths so they're just pure human production which means there will be uh, corruption within that production because the source even the beginning of the source was not divine but purely human nobody give anybody no divine authority came for the methodology of hadith nor the production of the hadith nor even the collection of the hadith so that implies there will always be impurity within the hadith secondly when you look at the historical uh, th secondly the form of the hadiths are very uh, often in a particular mold so the hadiths have clearly been shaped by those who passed them on so how reliable is that information when these uh, speeches and talks of, and, and information about Muhammad has been clearly shaped to various formulas in the written production. Uh, thirdly, the historical act, there is very little historical background information to hadiths, individual hadiths. You find uh, words by Muhammad, Prophet Muhammad, or false Prophet Muhammad, and in those words you'll find very little historical information or background behind those words showing you those words are actually not rooted in any history and then finally fourthly uh, a lot of these hadiths are political social political productions used to buttress certain political social and economic uh, agendas and that's why they're preserved and passed on or even produced so all those four issues undermine a lot of this um, science of hadith
And because they're so poor in their historical reliability, that's why we get that statement here. Um, later, as the purity of the knowledge of the sun had become threatened, Allah caused the Muslim Ummah to produce individuals with exceptional memory skills and analytical expertise who travelled tirelessly to collect thousands of narrations and distinguish the true words of the prophetic wisdom of those corrupted by weak memories, etc. That's why they're making such a big deal of the science of Hadith. When in reality, it's so full of mythological, uh, sociological, economic and political agendas that much of it is unreliable. And much of it actually proves the opposite of what they're trying to say. So, the science of Hadith, basically, is useless. And it's not worth the paper it's written on. No matter how great these scholar, Islamic scholars are, no matter how great their minds are and the great work that they've done on Hadith, the bottom line is, the historical uh, foundation is built on sinking sand. That's my understanding of the science of Hadith. And we've not even got into Western historical method and how we can compare the Western historical method to the science of Hadith and see which is more strong. I mean, let's just do that. Let's just do that for a minute. Let's just look at the historical verification and see how that stands up to Western historiography. So let's just read um, a little bit and then I'll, I'll, let, let, I'll bring in uh, Western historiography, Western uh, ways of doing history with, with uh, this science of Hadith. According to the reference of particular authority, there are four types of Hadith that can be defined. Divine and revelation from Allah relayed with the words of the Prophet Marfu elevated a narration from the Prophet, I heard the Prophet saying, uh, Mokuf, forgive the Arabic, stopped a narration from companion only, where we are commanded to, Maktu served as narration from the successor. So now we have a list. Divine revelation relayed through, sayings of the Prophet, companion, successor, successor to the successor, reporter, Bukhari or Muslim. According to the links of Insad, Isnad, interrupted or uninterrupted, six categories can be identified. Musnad, supported, a hadith which is reported by a traditionalist based on what he learned from his teacher at a time of life suitable for learning. Similarly in turn for each teacher until the Insad reaches a well-known companion who in turn reports from the Prophet. Mut, Asil, continuous, a hadith with an uninterrupted Isnad, which goes back only to a companion or successor. Mursal, hurried, if the link between the successor of the Prophet is missing, when a successor says the Prophet said. Munkwata, broken, is a hadith whose link anywhere before the successor, closer to the traditionalist according, recording the hadith is missing. Uh, Moadan, perplexing, is a hadith whose reporter omits two or more consecutive reporters in the Insnad. Mul Alak hanging is a hadith whose reporter omits the whole isnad and quotes the Prophet directly. The link is missing at the beginning. According to the number of reporters involved in each stage of isnad, five categories of hadith can be identified. Mut Awater, consecutive, is a hadith which is reported by such a large number of people that they cannot be expected to agree upon a lie all of them together. Ahad, isolated, is a hadith which is narrated by people whose number does not reach that of the Mutwata. It is further classified into Mas'u, famous hadith reported by more than two reporters, as is rare, strong at any stage in the Isna 
Only two reporters are found to narrate the hadith. Garib, strange, at some stage of the isnad, only one reporter is found relating it. According to the nature of the text, an isnad, a munkah denounced is a hadith which is reported by a weak narrator and whose narration goes against another authentic hadith. Mudraj interpolated an addition by a reporter to the text of the hadith being narrated. According to the reliability and memories of the reporter, this provides the final verdict on the hadith. Four categories can be identified. Sahih, Sound, Imam, al Shafi states that the following requirements for a hadith which is not mutwatwa to be acceptable. Each reporter should be trustworthy in his religion. He should be known to be truthful in his narrating, to understand what he narrates, to know how a different expression can alter the meaning and to report the wording of the hadith verbatim, not only its meaning. Now, I have to stop here because there's a lot of dishonesty going on here or misunderstanding because it's given all, it, it, the, you read this and, and, and it's given the impression that the historical information that's been passed on uh, over the centuries from Muhammad to, to right through the history is so accurate because we have these brilliant memorizers, we have checks and balances, we have people checking the, that we can follow the chain going back and that we have many other sources verifying this and it's so strong and so powerful that you can rely on this information. But It's blatantly obvious that when you read the hadiths, when, when you read Bukhari, it's blatantly obvious to anybody who's read any bit of history that a lot of those hadiths are classified, structured, produced in a very... Um, what can I say, in a very um, formulaic fashion. In other words, uh, the stories are very often reduced to either pithy sayings or uh, pithy parabolic stories. And again, what that means is these stories may uh, uh, of are kind of stories that have had a kind of wide circulation for various social and political reasons, but then they've been reduced to a formula. So they're not really historical in the sense that Often the, the productions of, the, of later times to suit historical and uh, to suit political and economic agenda. And then they're filtered and even changed more by the redactor who then makes it formulate in order to put it down in a certain uh, encyclopedic kind of fashion in the collection of the Hadith. So in other words, we're not really getting pure historical information and sources here. We're getting a lot of redacted, edited material. And a lot of it's production, produced, not because it's memorized, memorized from the time of Muhammad, but it's material that's been produced by later caliphates to substantiate their political agenda and the agendas of their subjects. So in other words, you have this false um, image here being painted of such great accuracy, but the reality is it, it, it's, that's not the reality. So what this means is this, this, this verification 
of hadiths. The system, this method, is really, um, it can only be an invention. It can only be a birthface invention. So whenever these scholars are saying that uh, a certain hadith can, can go, be traced back and have many, many uh, other sources verifying it, I find it very hard to believe um, and doesn't ring true to, to the actual reading of the hadiths themselves. The hadiths give it away. The hadiths give it away. They lack that historical core of truth within the narrations. Um, so, in terms of uh, Western historiography, uh, notice the there's nothing in those in the science of hadith concerning two two aspects uh, outside testimony i.e. Uh, enemy attestation so western historiography uses one of a method called uh, enemy attestation um, so there's no enemy attestation there so this is 100% pure biased history I mean 100% pure bias we can't corroborate this from outside sources by enemies all right. Number two, there's no historical cooperation here. The emphasis on the importance of archaeology and other historical verification. So, for example, uh, the Gospel of John. Um, we can verify many, many historical facts in the Gospel of John by archaeology proving that certain things that John says about Jerusalem is correct. So, for example, John says there's a pool of Bethesda and we find a pool of Bethesda in Jerusalem. You notice in this science of Hadith there is nothing, uh, there, is nothing there that talks about this or the importance of historical verification in other methods such as archaeology. And I think the other thing as well is there's a, there's a difference between first-hand eyewitness material and material that goes through many, many, many hands. And the science of hadith, of hadith commits a problem, a fallacy, of thinking that just because you have many, many narrators who have collected the sayings of Muhammad, that that guarantees the truth of it. But actually, it doesn't because those many, many narrators will take away or add to the original material. Whereas the Gospels are eyewitnesses and they are written down text so nobody can tamper with the stories or information because they're in a fixed text. Whereas the Hadith stories are not in fixed text but are passed on by oral tradition. So these ongoing narrators will uh, change and, 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 and mould these stories to suit their own um, tribal, political and economic uh, agenda. So, so what that means is these stories cannot, uh, will not have a, a, fixity, a, fixity, a, fix, a fixity that a text would have of original eyewitnesses. So, you know, it begs the question of how much material was actually based on real life information about Muhammad. So, so just looking at it from a purely Western histor historical point of view, there's issues there concerning the Hadith. 
Right, so those are just some thoughts on the science of Hadith from a historical Western point of view. There's a, it, it's not worth the paper it's written on. Alright, thank you for listening and God bless you.